Sometimes, you know, we struggle a bit, we stutter a bit, and all of these. Maybe you have an argument with their parents, or maybe we shun our duties to God. So, to talk a bit more about this, I would like to invite Brother Abu Musab to come to the stage. Um, a bit about him, uh, Brother Abu Musab works as a trainer in Samsung, the rival company of Apple, as you, most of you know. So, he works in a trainer as, uh, in Samsung, and he's uh, he's not uh, well. He and he's not, you know, like resident in Dubai. He's come from very far, so to grace us with his presence. Um, he's a trainer, as a master trainer, and has acquired a m number of other skills as well. Managing people is, I guess, the core of his work, and is also an important skill that is needed for leadership. But you know, I've been speaking too much, so I pass on the mic to. Sheikh Abu Musab, right now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I feel short. I know I'm short, but with this uh, podium, I feel even shorter. Um, I have a bunch of things to uh, discuss with you today, and honestly, since you mentioned Samsung, I want to take the opportunity not to talk trash about our competitors. I'm going to try to set a good example and say that uh, apples are great. They're good fruits. And uh, generally, when you go to the supermarket, if you found an apple that someone took a bite from, you don't buy it. Did anyone get it? Okay, anyways. <laughs> all right, all right. <clears throat> So coming to the topic, um, in this crazy world we're living in today, uh, people often attribute their success to two things. When someone is successful, they usually attribute them to two things. Who can guess uh, what those two things are? Or one of them, and I'll be satisfied. And that can apply to the brothers or sisters. When someone becomes successful, what is, what is it that they think is the reason behind it? Young man in the back. Parents? Oh, I haven't heard that in a while. Good try. Yes, brother. Wealth? Uh-huh. So like wealth makes them wealthier. Now I'm looking for something else. Yes, young man in the back. Hard work. There you go. That's, that's one correct answer. From the sisters? Yes, sister? Persistence? Okay, hard work, persistence, synonymous to some degree. Another sister? Luck? Luck or luck? Actually, these are the right two answers. Most people attribute their success to their hard work or what they call luck. Now, why do you think so? What would be the reason why someone will think about these two elements and not think about the real reason behind it? What are they lacking? Yes. They lack gratitude? Okay, yes. It's indirect, but it's there, yes. Iman. Very good. Well, you guys are better than what I thought. So basically, my lecture is going to be much easier if every time I ask a question, you guys get the right answers. Before I delve into the reasons or why these people may have an issue, and what is the Islamic uh, outlook on it, I would like to get a definition for success. Everybody seemed to have accepted uh, the idea of me saying successful. A person is successful. But have you ever really thought about what success really means? Like when you say this person is successful, what is it that they have acquired? What do they have that will make us consider them successful? No more hands, huh? It got a little difficult. Yes, what, what's success? Wealth. Okay, so if you got money, you're successful. That's good. Yes, man? Contentment? Mm. Yes? Okay, achieving your personal goals is considered a form of success. What else? How about a diploma, degree, PhD, master's? 
Is that considered success? People with a lot of money, people with status. If you become some sort of diplomat or ambassador or, you know, uh, the consul of some sort of embassy, in some ways, you are considered to have been successful in this life. But the truth of the matter is, our definition of success is extremely different. Who can give us an Islamic definition of success? Yes. Living a happy life. Okay. That's a good one. Yes. Being a, <laughs> being a half of the Quran. That's a better one. So, which means all those who don't have the Quran memorized are failures? No? Because that's a little rough. Right? It's a good one, but that's a little rough. Yes. Having Iman. The young man in the back. Achieving Jannah. Now we're talking. I will give you one decisive ayah, one comprehensive, conclusive ayah that leaves little door for negotiation and speculation. And that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Every soul shall taste death. Everybody. No exception to the rule. Everybody will taste death. Each one of us here will eventually be in a position where he will pass away and move on to the next life. And only then, once you're in the next life, you will be paid your wages in full. Meaning nowadays you could work so hard and you won't be appreciated. Then Allah says, So whosoever is moved away from the fire, you know, zuhziha, it's like you're dragging someone and pushing them away. Like someone is about to fall, and you're grabbing them and moving them away. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ Whosoever is moved away from the fire, وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ And then he's admitted to paradise, then Allah says, فَقَدْ فَقَدْ فَاز He has attained success. And this worldly life is nothing but delusion. Think about that for a minute. Okay, if this is the definition of success, then we have a problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that this is about the life to come. Right? And, but we're living in this worldly life. I mean, we're living right now today. So what's, how is my success going to be determined if I will only find out once I die and go to the life to come? So how do we define success in this worldly life? I gave you the hereafter definition of success. What do you think will be the definition of success in this worldly life? Anyone from the brothers or sisters? It's a tricky question, huh? Contentment? These are correct answers, but they're broad. I want something specific. I said success is being moved away from the fire, admitted to paradise. That's wonderful. Once you die, that's wonderful. But I, what, what about success now? Now, in this worldly life? What is success now? Striving to be obedient to Allah. Let me put it this way. I would say, success now is whatever will lead you to success then. Is it clear? Or are you busy with the papers? Whatever will lead you to success then is success now. So let us look at the, I would say, un-Islamic uh, point of view and the Islamic point of view. Let's look at them one by one. Money. Yes, you guys said wealth, right? Wealth is, an, is a sign of success. Tayyip. Let's say you bring a bunch, a buckload of money. Yawm al-Qiyamah, you bring a lot of money with you. Is it going to give you success then? Can anyone pay money to ransom themselves from the hellfire? Yes or no? Is every, everybody agrees? No. Even the richest of people can't pay money to get out of hell? Are you sure? What if you got like 10 billion dollars? What's bigger than a billion? My children know a bunch of other numbers that I've never heard in my, you know, in, in my days. They have like new numbers that are more than a billion and trillion. There's like something else beyond that. 
What if you had that much money? Can you? Can you say on Yomar I mean, come on. I could, I could, you know, purchase a whole country. So money, wealth, which is considered to be a, sex, a success factor in this worldly life, will not benefit you on Yomar Qiyamah. Second, let's say you had degrees. You were very educated. Can your PhD save you from the hellfire if Allah had a decree for you? Nope. The most educated person in the world, the encyclopedia of his time, the one who is a reference better than Google, will still not be able to save himself from the punishment on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the last one is power or status. People that have a lot of power or status will not be saved from the punishment on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So all of the elements that the people consider to be success in this worldly life, we find out that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah they are of no value. Then what would be the right things then? Yes. Birrul Walidain, okay, that's, that's a good start. Dutifulness to one's parents. Now we're gonna talk about the currency, the actual real currency for success in the life to come. Mind you, it's not gonna be money, it's not gonna be education, it's not gonna be your status. It's gonna be being dutiful to your parents as one. What else? I'm sorry? Using your money to give charity and zakah. Very good. Yes, brother. Good character. Wonderful. The one all the way in the back. Fulfilling the pillars of Islam. Now we're talking. Aha. Uh -huh. We want to be a little bit more specific. Salah. Salah will be something that will save you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. True or false? Big time. The first thing that you will be questioned about, the first thing that will be dealt with on Yawm Al-Qiyamah is... يُنظَرُ فِي صَلَاتِهِ Allah will look into the person's prayer. فَإِنْ صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ سَائِرُ عَمَلُهُ If it is correct, then the rest of his deeds will be correct. وَإِنْ فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ سَائِرُ عَمَلُهُ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ السَّلَامُ And if it is corrupt, then the rest of his deeds will be corrupt. So before you speak about Hajj and Umrah and Zakah and, and dutifulness to one's parents and all these good stuff, the first thing you have to stop and pause and think about is prayer. Prayer is the most important and fundamental thing after your belief in Allah. Good. So we have salah. What else? That's it. We run out. Iman. Okay, that's very good. Iman, because if you have the wrong belief system or you are missing some of the elements or articles of faith, then you have a fundamental issue. Because salah cannot be of value unless you have the right foundation. Let's just say salah is like a decoration to a wall. Salah is the wall and all your other acts of worship. I'm sorry, the salah is like the, uh, the decoration and the wall is iman. If you don't have a wall, can you put a painting? If I got a painting right now and hung it right here, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. So someone who prays but doesn't have the right iman is technically giving away his time for nothing. So iman is more important. Certainly than salah. And of course, we can enumerate all of the elements of Islam. It's no surprise to any one of you. The first thing that we dealt with is the fundamental difference between the definition of success in Islamic principles and un-Islamic principles. So when you think about success, you need to take a time out. And don't start thinking about the job and your salary and your income, or in your case, what school you're going to go to and what kind of degree you're going to get. I'm not saying this is not important. By all means, this is important, but not on the expense of the more important things. The true success, which is being safe from the fire. Because someone can do all the things that will make him successful in this world, and will, these will be the same things that will make him unsuccessful in the life to come. So you need to weigh things out and make the right choices. But so we have two things I wanted to discuss. Now we agreed on a definition of success. Everybody understands we're on the same page? Anyone's confused? Good. We said people attribute their success to their own, their own deeds, right? Their own good, their own intelligence and luck. Who do you think of? Which uh, character or which individual or which personality comes in the Quran? That reminds you of someone that thought he was all that. 
And it was all because he was so, so, you know, such a businessman. Oh, my, mashallah, we have many hands. The sisters don't know him, the brothers do. All the way in the back over there. Who? Fir'aun. Uh-huh. You came close, Akhi. They used to be neighbors. <laughs> yes, brother. Karun. Everybody knows Karun? Karun had it going on. I mean, this guy had so much money, they couldn't carry the keys. The people struggled to carry the keys for his wealth. Not just the wealth itself. He was on some next level stuff. And when he was, you know, questioned, and when he was told, given certain advice, what did he say? I was given this because of a knowledge I have. This, all this money you see is because I am so skillful. I am so smart. I am so worthy. I am so good. Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مَنْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُ قُوَّةً وَأَكْثَرُ جَمْعَةً Does he not know that Allah has destroyed previous, previously, before him, many nations who actually had more strength and accumulated more wealth than he did? So what do we learn from this lesson? Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us that whatever you have is not really because you are so good, it's because Allah allowed you to have it. And so as Muslims, we don't attribute whatever we do because of our own good. Who do we praise? Allah. Mind you, you can have the traits, but who enables you to capitalize on them? Allah. If you don't show gratitude to Allah, and you attribute all good goodness to yourself, you are resembling Qarun in so many ways. That's why the Muslim, the successful Muslim, when he's asked, Akhi, mashallah, how did you do this? The first thing you should say, Alhamdulillah, okay, Allah is merciful. It's a mercy from Allah. I, I worked hard, but it's facilitation from Allah. These are blessings from Allah. In it, not, just, not just words that he says out of showing off. No, no, this is based on his, his iman in his heart. That this is because of Allah. Nothing, not even one thing that you have is because of you. Everything that you have is, everything that you have. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Not even a single bounty you have except that it is from Allah. But humans are ungrateful. So be careful of being like Qarun and praise Allah. And what's the second thing people attribute their, their success to? Luck. Now luck is a very tricky term. Lucky, he's a lucky person. Good luck, bad luck. What do you guys think? Is it okay as a Muslim to say good luck? Who gave the fatwa? Someone said no. Who, who gave the fatwa? It's okay, don't be scared. We're not going to take you out. You gave the fatwa? You got a point. Does anyone think it's okay to say good luck? MashaAllah, this brother is so lucky, yaakhi. Or uh, somebody is, you know, they have a game or something. Good luck, brother. I wish you the best. What do you think? Why are you guys scared to answer? It's okay if you don't know. Think about the possibilities. You over there, in the front, yes. No, but I'm looking at you, yes. It's whenever you look at someone, they look at someone else. It's like, I know that trick back in school, Akhi. The teacher is not talking, she'll be calling your name. The teacher will be calling your name like, me? How many Wajdis are in the class? One in the whole school. And I'm talking to you. So, I'm talking to you. Yes, is it okay to say good luck? No? You want to sign your name on this fatwa? The truth of the matter is, it depends on what you consider luck to be. The uh, Western definition, if you look up the word luck in the dictionary, it will say to you, it will say, success or failure, apparently brought by chance, rather than through one's own actions. Meaning, success or failure, as in good luck or bad luck, having to do with chance. Not something that you did. Meaning this person wasn't deserving of this, he just got lucky. Just random chance, 
he got something. Is this an okay definition in Islam? Absolutely not. This is where we have an issue. This is where we have some reservation. We don't believe luck to be this way. However, the term luck exists in the Quran. And whoever is able to cite the ayah right now, I will give him nothing. A, a big nothing, this big. It's right in my pocket. Ah, MashaAllah. This brother, this brother, I can tell stories about him, but I don't want to put him on the spot, even though it's part of my job to put you on the spot. But we'll skip. Anybody else before I resort to my reference, who when we forget, he reminds us, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Just as anyone can think of an ayah in the Quran that mentions luck. Aywa. Hmm. You guys are too busy playing Fortnite. Huh? No one knows? Khalas, we refer to our Shaykh. Very good, that's one. I'm looking for another one. First of all, says the people said at the time of Qarun, they said, oh, we wish we were like him. We were given what he was given. Verily, he is a lucky man. He has a lot of luck. And what's the other ayah? وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ And none will be granted this. This is when Allah began the ayah, اتفع, uh, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا سَيَّعَةُ The evil and the good are not equal. اتفع بالتي أحسن Put forth that which is better. Uh, to the point that the person with whom you have an enmity will become like a close friend. Then Allah said, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا But this trait, only those patient people will be granted that. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ And only a person who's been given a lot of good and fortune will be granted that trait. So from an Islamic perspective, our concept of luck is actually your portion of good. Whatever Allah had decreed for you of good fortune, this is what luck is. And the scholars discuss this in detail. They say, if this is your understanding, if you attribute this goodness to Allah, then there's no harm to say, good luck, brother. It's almost like a dua, as if you're saying, oh, Allah grant him success. Meaning Allah give him his portion of goodness in this dua. However, the scholars have a reservation about the term bad luck, because we don't usually attribute any bad to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so among the Muslims, some of the scholars say it is okay to say lucky and, and lucky and good luck w in this context. But when speaking to non-Muslims, bear in mind that they usually don't associate this with, with the divine entity. They think it's a matter of chance, it's a matter of randomness, it's chaos. They don't believe that Allah Azza wa is responsible for these things or is the one who decrees them. And so you might want to avoid it when using it with them. Tayyip, so so far, We've agreed, I hope so, on the definition of success. And we've also explained that in Islam, we don't look at success as you working hard or you being just fortunate. It is actually something that Allah Azza wa Jal facilitates for you. I want to highlight two main things, which are the title of the lecture. Two main reasons that we can emphasize on uh, to be means for one to attain success in this worldly life and therefore in the akhirah and the first one is obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obeying Allah is the key to all success in fact everything is a byproduct everything that you do in terms of obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or obeying your parents and any type of obedience among the creation is actually a byproduct to your obedience to Allah because Allah commanded that. And this is an opportunity that many of us miss out on. A lot of us lead the life of sinfulness, we ask Allah to forgive us, and then they wonder why they're not successful. Mind you, when I say they're not successful, does that mean that their bank account is bankrupt? No. These guys might have a lot of money. Huh? They might be getting some status among the people. But why are we saying they're unsuccessful? Because their relationship with Allah is zero. They have no real relationship with Allah. Because there's no obedience to Allah, even though outwardly we're saying, oh, this is a, such a successful man. But in reality, in the definition of Islam, if this person is going to end up in the hellfire, then there's absolutely no success there. 
And so that person is really not successful. On the contrary, someone could be obedient to Allah and externally to us, he might not be the wealthiest or might not have the highest status, but in Allah's sight, this person is as successful as human beings can be. So my brother and sister, which one would you like to be? Which category would you like to belong to? And if you want to make a decision, then make it wise. As in, the only way you can decide properly, because one will say, but you know, I'm living in this life now, it's fun is available, it's at hand, I want to enjoy myself, that's cool. But you have to look at this worldly life in comparison to the life to come in terms of duration. What is the duration of this worldly life? What is the duration of this worldly life? How long will you live? Does anyone here know their date of death? Raise your hand. So we can leave all of us and leave you here by yourself. Anyone knows when they will die? Have you ever gotten a passport that says, you know, DOB, you know, January 1st, 1980, DOD in 2019? And you're like, oh, 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 oh. Hey, this, are you sure this is my passport? Yeah, we're pretty sure. And how do you know? Well, we have information. We're the embassy, right? Nobody knows. Anybody knows? Nobody knows. But usually, what is the average lifespan of a human being? Nowadays, 60, 70? That's for those who are living healthy. Huh? Mess up a little bit and you can cut 20 years from that. By all means. By all means, if you're live, leading an unhealthy life, you can easily go out, out of nowhere. And we're not talking about accidents, we're talking about, you know, health issues. You know, people that smoke, uh, or people that, you know, overeat and things of the sort. You don't know what kind of disease is going to hit you. Subhanallah, you don't know. Says, this body is a trust. I don't want to go on this discussion right now. I know I get a little excited when we talk about fitness. But we'll leave that aside for now. The bottom line is, you have to look at this worldly life versus Al-Akhirah. How long is Al-Akhirah, brother? Forever? Yeah, Sheikh. Are you sure it's forever? That's a big word. Who said 2,000? 50,000? And then afterwards it ex expires? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm not talking about the duration of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I'm talking about once humans die and they're resurrected. And now we're in the life to come. We're in that hereafter. Whether Jannah or Jahannam. How long? Forever. And we don't know forever. In our life, you've never experienced forever. Your most favorite shirt is definitely not forever. Eventually, it's gonna wear out, or your brother will take it from you when it becomes too tight on you. Even though you love it so much, it's not forever. One's parents are not forever. One's friends are not forever. Maybe the house in which you live is not forever. We don't know forever. Everything we know expires, comes to an end. So forever is only understood in the life to come. That's a big deal. That's a big deal because if I'm going to compare 60 years versus forever, and then I choose the 60 years, that's crazy. That's some terrible decision making right there. So make sure that you put that in the forefront. When we speak about obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the most important thing. Allah says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ Whosoever does righteous deeds, whether male or female, and they are believers, then we will surely grant them a goodly life. Allah promised that obedience to Him necessitates that you live satisfied. Low income, you're satisfied. No degree, you're satisfied. Whatever the situation may be, even calamities are befalling you one after the other, you are still satisfied. You're satisfied, you're content. You have contentment with Allah. Why? Allah will give you that. Because you're doing good deeds. And that's something humans can't control. Nobody can control it. Nobody can take that away from you. If Allah wants you to be satisfied with your condition, because you're obedient to Him, no one can strap that away. It's an amazing fact. And it's an amazing reality that we miss out on. Another evidence that it is success Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum zhunubakum and wa man yuti'i allaha wa rasoolahu 
فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا Whosoever obeys Allah and His Messenger has already attained the greatest type of success. You know that the verb used is in the past tense? Because Yafuz is the present tense or future, depending on the context. But Faza, it's done already. You already attained success in the book of Allah by you obeying Allah and His Messenger. And so, what are we waiting for? And Islam, my brothers and sisters, is reasonable. Is reasonable in the sense that you could have been commanded to pray 50 times a day. Did you guys know we were supposed to pray 50 times a day in the beginning? Can you imagine how much time you'll be spend, spend making wudu? I thought about it the other day, Allah. I thought about it the other day and it, it, I've known the hadith for a while. Alhamdulillah. But I've never internalized it. I've never actually sat down and thought about it. But the other day, I think I was traveling and I was combining my prayers. And I was, you know, the day was busy. I'm just running around, barely getting things done. And that's why Allah made the concession of combining prayers when you travel. Because when you travel, you're not in the normal environment. And it hit me. I was like, imagine, I was talking to myself. Imagine if I had to pray 50 times a day. Yeah, if Fajr times how many? Times 10. Dhuhr times 10. Asr times 10. Maghrib times 10. Isha times 10. Are you kidding me? I thought about it. By the way, you wouldn't finish Maghrib before Isha. I mean, if you prayed Maghrib 10 times, Isha would come in and you still pray Maghrib. And now you have to pray Isha 10 times. That's 4 rak'at times 10. 40 rak'at. You don't even do this in Taraweeh. But Allah is merciful. Even though that was what He decreed, because He created us to worship Him, nothing else. The Prophet wasallam, as mercy to, for the Ummah, He continued to negotiate on our behalf until it was reduced to five with the reward of what? Fifty. So you still get the reward, but you only have to do it five times a day. And we see ourselves missing out and failing even with that. Subhanallah. Even with this, somehow, some way we fail. Brothers haven't seen Fajr since, you know, five years. Does not know what Fajr Salah feels like. Knocked out cold every single day. Why well, Allah pray playing, brother? I was playing last night. I was tired. I'm tired. I was tired. Same story, different day. Ya yeah, Sheikh. Now what are you, a koala bear? You know koala bears sleep 23 hours a day? 20, well, 22 or 23 hours. They wake up one hour, they get everything done. I don't want to elaborate. You know, eating, bathroom, everything else, and then psh, go back to sleep. Some brothers are like koala bears, man. Ya yeah, Sheikh, wake up for Fajr, man. Fajr is that the opening salah that will determine what your day is going to look like. Rest assured, if we started off on the wrong foot, it's not going to be pretty afterwards. And I could say the same thing about other salawat, but I think Fajr is the one that hits us the most. So look at us. How many elements of success are we missing out on in terms of just doing the five daily prayers? I haven't even, I haven't even gone elsewhere. We're talking about basic stuff, basic stuff. But anyways, the reminder benefits the believers. The second thing is obedience to parents. So obeying Allah and then obeying the parents. This is where a lot of us have squandered hundreds of thousands of opportunities to attain Allah's pleasure by mistreating our parents. By misbehaving with our parents. By disobeying our parents. Even though our parents have the greatest right after the right of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did you guys know that? Do you know that it's more important for you to obey your parents than your teacher in school or your friend or your colleague? or anybody else for this matter, after obeying Allah and His Messenger والسلام, the highest rank in the world would be your own parents, which we are in the habit of disobeying on daily basis. An exception would be given to the wife or the husband. For the married sister, this is whose right is given precedence. For the rest of us, everybody else, you must obey your parents. 
And actually, obeying your parents is one aspect of dutifulness. Meaning, this is the bare minimum. The bare minimum is that you obey them. There's actually a lot more that is expected of you. What does Allah say in the Quran? وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ الْكِبْرَ عِنْدَكَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا هَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا This ayah requires a 70-day workshop. Anybody wants to sign up? MashaAllah, 70 days? I quit already, ya Shaykh. This ayah requires years of elaboration because the, the mufassirin or those who interpret the Quran and explain the Quran, they say the smallest term that can be used in the Arabic language to signify displeasure is uf. I notice uf is not really the, in terms of phonetics, it's not the longest word with many sounds. It's actually an expression. It's not really a word in a sense that it doesn't make much sense. It's an expression of being, uh, I would, I, in modern language, like, uh, does it make sense to you? When your parents say something, say, uh, that's off right there. So it could be your, it could be rolling your eyes. It could be the way you nod with your head. It could be your, the tone of voice. It could be flat out. All of these actually fall under the title Uf. So think about it. How many times do you do this a day? Stop playing video games. Ya Sheikh. Baba, I just started. Or mom tells you, your mom tells you to do something and you react. I have bad news for you. That's not acceptable. That is not, a, even if your parents are cool about it. You may have the hippest, coolest, you know, outgoing parents in the world. They're like, you know, they're cooler than you are. And they don't mind at all. You can't do it. Because you're dealing with Allah. And so, if we think about this on its own, we have a, a serious issue. This is why we learn from the Prophet ﷺ when someone came to him and wanted to go out and you know struggle in the cause of Allah. He said, do you have parents? Yes. Are they alive? Yes. He said, go and struggle with them. In another hadith, and there are multiple narrations, even though the wording may differ, signifying that the Prophet ﷺ said that verily Jannah is under the feet of the mother. فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ ثَمْ There's a famous uh, fabricated hadith, الْجَنَّةَ تَحْتُ أَقْضَامِ الْأُمَّهَاتِ That particular wording is not authentic. But the idea that Jannah is under the feet of the parents is actually proven by multiple narrations that are authentic. Do you understand Jannah? You know, عَرْضُهَا السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ is under your mother's foot. In a sense, that this is where you can attain it. By you lowering yourself to this degree. This is why when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, "Man أَحَقُّ النَّاسِ بِحُسْنِ صَحَابَتِي Who is the most deserving of having my good companionship? Who should I befriend? And who you, you would say your classmate, uh, the person who is like-minded? He said, "Ummuka, your mother. Okay, not an expected answer. Not what the man was looking for at least. The Sahabi who asked this question wasn't looking for his mother. So he said, okay, fine. Thumma man, then who? He told him again, who? Your mother. Yeah. Twice. He asked a third time. Thumma man, then who? He said a third time, your mother. Subhanallah. And when he asked a fourth time, he said who? Abuk, your father. Now which one of you can say that your parents are your closest friends? Many will say they're my closest enemies. My parents are a pain, man. I can't do anything, I can't live my life, I can't enjoy myself, my parents are this, they're too strict, they don't let me go, they don't let me do this, they don't let me do that, subhanallah. And Allah says in the Quran, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَلِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنَ أَنْ إِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَى أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِهِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا 
Allah commanded that you are dutiful to your parents. Your mother bore you in weakness after weakness. You know how difficult pregnancy is? The brothers will never be able to answer. Unless you've been pregnant before, in which case, let us know. But I don't think so. It's, I, I don't even want to go there. Okay, it's something else. It's so difficult. You can't even carry a sheikh uh, two pounds. If we told you to carry a bag, you see people complaining. Brother, can you just take this plastic bag that has a bottle of water in it? This thing weighs two ounces. You find yourself, this is heavy, your arm is sore, your biceps and triceps grew because of carrying a bag. And your mother carried you in her womb, inside her body, and she had no choice. She couldn't take you out when she was tired. Can't sleep comfortably. You know, that's what Allah is, is alluding to. That you should be thankful to your parents. Then Allah said, and if both of your parents, if they were struggling with you, imagine if every day your parents said, to come, come, come here. I want you to stop praying. Or I want you to worship Buddha. Or I want you to, you know, disbelieve in Allah. If every day they spent their whole time trying to bring you to kufr, trying to bring you to shirk, trying to invite you to disobedience, Allah says, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Don't obey them. But what did Allah say afterwards? صَحِبُهُمَا what, what is the word? From Sahaba. You know you say Sahabi? Do you know Sahabi? Companion? Sahibuma meaning be their companion in this worldly life. Ma'rufa. Yani even if your parents were calling you to evil, you're supposed to be their friend. In the sense that you don't disrespect them, but you don't obey them. You don't obey them when they tell you to disobey Allah, but you don't cross the line in terms of respect. Now we have our parents telling us, come obey Allah, and we are the ones going against them. Ajib. Wallahi, it's amazing. And then we want success. And people wonder why there's a hellfire and why people will be burnt in the hellfire. Look at the human beings, man. Human beings are vicious creatures. If Allah doesn't guide one of us to, to you know, rationalism and, and intellect and goodness, we are wild. Humans are wild. In terms of what they do to earn the hellfire. Then they wonder, why, why, what did I do? What didn't you do? Your whole life you're ungrateful to Allah. And you're evil to mankind, evil to the animals, evil to the creation. And then they wonder, why is there hellfire? Well, because you earned it. That's why. There's no other destination. So what are we doing with our parents? Which one of us can sit here and say, Wallahi, ana zayil full. With my parents, I am, I, I'll get a hundred out of a hundred. I don't think any one of us can say that. Our, seen, our righteous predecessors, the sheikh would be with his students. With his students. He's a sheikh. Not like us, you know, this modern sheikh. No, no, a real sheikh. We're not shayukh in any way, shape or form. But you know, whatever, the term is used loosely. The real deal sheikh will be teaching his students. Her mother will scream at him and tell him to go feed the chicken. Wallah. Go feed the chicken. One of us will say right now, if my mother came right now, let's just hypothetically. And she said, what, the, what, what are you doing here? Go buy me a juice. What would one of us say today? Mom, I mean, hello? <laughs> I have the people here. When I finish, I'll go get you the juice. The sheikh would leave. He doesn't even know you. His mother said, go get juice. He's gone. He's getting juice. He doesn't know anybody here. I don't think any one of us would do this today. Illa man rahim Allah. He will say, I will work it out with her later. I will fix it later. He will, he will be worried about the people more than his mother. But we learn from them that they were worried about their mothers more than the people. Now we're ashamed of our mothers. Some people don't like his mother wears hijab. She wants to come to where he is. No, 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 don't come. Because the hijab, you know, he, he's embarrassed. Subhanallah. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told a story about those people who were stuck in the cave. You guys know the story of the people who were stuck in the cave? Everybody knows it? Those who went into a cave and then the rock rolled and, and blocked their entrance, they couldn't leave anymore? How did, they, how did Allah save them? Each one of them had a story to tell. It was about their sincerity to Allah. And the most important one is the one who 
had a father and a mother whom he always would give the milk to before his own wife and, and children. And one day he was tardy, he ran behind, he didn't catch, up, catch him on time. By the time he got the milk and came back, both of his parents were sleeping. He missed the opportunity. What did he do? Did he say, ah, alhamdulillah, woo, more milk for me. Yalla. When brought the kids, had a party of milk. Nope. The man stood there. Don't ask me how. He stood there all night long. And his children are at his feet, begging him, you know, we want our share of milk. And he wouldn't give him the milk until he gave his parents first. Until they woke up and had their share. And when he said, Oh Allah, if I have done the seeking your pleasure, then remove this calamity. And Allah made the rock move. Allah made the rock move on its own. Hulk wasn't there. Dinosaurs weren't there. You know, John Cena wasn't there. It just moved because of this person's dutifulness to his parents. So this is a reminder to me, because I have parents. And to you. You need to reset your relationship with your parents starting now. Not later, not tomorrow, now. You will no longer be mean or disobedient or undutiful to your parents. You cannot afford it. You cannot afford it. This is your biggest opportunity to please Allah and enter Jannah while they are alive. Because once they pass away, as it comes in some of the narrations, the angels will say, when the, when the mother dies, this is the one for whom we had been honoring. And now that she's gone, you're not, you're not entitled to that anymore. You will lose that opportunity forever. So don't ever be difficult with your parents. Obey them, make them happy. Allah will bless you at this age and when you grow older. And Allah will continue, continue to bless you. And the trend goes the way Allah Azza wa Jal usually, usually, not always, deals with this matter is Allah will give you children that are obedient to you just like you were obedient to your parents. Similarly, if you're disobedient to your parents, Allah will give you children when your turn comes that are disobedient to you like you were disobedient to your children. So you're going to have to suffer twice. You will suffer now by being bad and then you will suffer when someone is being bad to you. And then there's another on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. We cannot afford that. So, by all means, if you want to be successful, you don't have to go looking outside, you don't have to take courses, you don't have to be a scientist or Einstein. All you have to do is obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be a good Muslim. Allah will grant you success in this worldly life and will grant you success in the life to come. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal by His beautiful names and ultimate attributes to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. Zakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.